Thank you, Trent, and another good morning to you, and I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open it to Psalm 119. And as we continue in our, um, don't get nervous, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, But as we we start in, or continue in our series, Summer in the Psalms, we're going to look at the longest psalm of, of the book of Psalms, and the longest chapter in the entire Bible. And Psalm 119 has 176 verses, and so uh, don't get nervous about, about us reading it all together. But, but what Psalm 119 is, is Psalm 119 provides us an incredibly deep and rich commentary on the Word of God. Like Psalm 19, Psalm 119 is kind of the longer version of Psalm 19, talking about the Word of God, something that C.S. Lewis described as a man being ravished by a moral beauty. Psalm 119 is the longest and the most thorough searching of the beauty and the depths of the Word of God. Now something we have to address before we dig into this so we're all on the same page, is that we believe here at Trinity that the Word of God containing the Old Testament and the New Testament is the inspired and the perfect Word of God, without error in any way, shape, or form. Paul tells Timothy in, 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 in his writing to him that, that the Word of God is, is God-breathed. The Scripture is God-breathed useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We believe that, that God's word is inspired. We believe that it is perfect in everything that it says. Psalm 19 says that, that the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. And we'll talk a little more about that next week because we're going to do two weeks on Psalm 119. And so we'll talk a little more about that next week, but I want to make sure that we're on the same page here. I want to make sure that, 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 that we're all starting on the same tracks of understanding that God's word is inspired by the Lord and, and, and it is useful for us in our daily lives. And, and if you're not there right now, that is okay. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad that you're, if, if, if you're not in that place of really believing that, because this is the perfect place to really um, wrestle with those things. And we'd love to talk with you more about that. But when you look at Psalm 119, If you read the whole psalm in one sitting, it doesn't take as long as maybe you think. If you read Psalm 119 in one sitting, which I recommend doing for for any psalm or or really for any book of the Bible for that matter, if you really want to get the big picture of what's happening, reading it in one sitting. When you do that, we can see multiple themes surface and resurface from the psalm. There's about five themes that I saw as I read through Psalm 119 that, that kind of surface and then resurface again throughout the psalm. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to be looking at these themes that the author gives to us. And these aren't in order of appearance in the psalm necessarily, but these are the five themes, five major themes that surface in the psalm. And the first theme that we see from Psalm 119 is that God's word is the guide to holy living. God's word is the guide, guide to, to holy, holy living. living. One of the, the most popular, popular passages in not only the psalm, but, but of the entire Bible is Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. And, and verse 9 is an introduction to, to, a, to a new section of the psalm. psalm. Each section of Psalm 119 is, is, is categorized or titled after a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and so, it's, so it's a great way for memory. For If you're memorizing Psalm 119, it's easy just to go through and just kind of like A, B, C, and each section is titled that way. And verse 9 starts a section, and it asks a question that many people are asking today. And that question is, how can a young man or young woman keep their way pure? It's a big question. It's a question that many have asked. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said, that, that, that there never was a more important question for a person, and never was there a finer time for asking it than at the commencement of life. Now we know that this applies to the young person and the seasoned person, but it's important to note that the author does say, how can a young man keep his way pure? It's important to, to, to identify that the author talks about youth. Now, why does he do that? Well, Maybe this, this unidentified author is, is a youth, is young, and is asking on behalf of himself. But I think the author asks this question with youth in mind because in our youth, 
and we've all been there, or maybe you're there right now, we tend to have the rather unfortunate combination of passion with a lack of wisdom. I think, we're all, I think we all agree with that. I don't think anybody's offended with that. In our youth, there are passions and energies to do great things, to find adventure and to change the world. But because of our youth, we just don't have the life experience to understand how life works at times. I know sometimes we think that. I remember back to high school, things I've said, and I just absolutely am so embarrassed by things I've said. Because I thought in high school I knew everything, or mostly everything. And I'd say things because I was so passionate about it, and yet I lacked the life experience and the wisdom. That's why God's word says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. Now, I'm not trying to be that, that, that old guy who, who sits on his porch and, and, and yells, get off my lawn to kids walking on, on his front lawn. I'm just being honest. I think all of us here can identify that in our youth, we aren't mature physically, neurologically, emotionally, or spiritually. And while there may be some adults today who still aren't mature in many of those ways, those who are young just haven't had the life experience to develop wisdom. So what's the answer to the psalmist's question? For the young people, for the seasoned people, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young person, and any person for that matter, keep their way of life pure, to be holy, to be set apart? And his answer comes in the second half of verse 9. And it is to guard it according to your word. The answer to the age-old question of living a pure and holy life begins with guarding. Now, this word guarding first appears in the first pages of the Bible. And and, and understanding what this word means from that context is really important for us to understand what Psalm 119 verse 9. We see this Hebrew word, shamar, surface in Genesis 2.15. God had created Adam from the ground, and and this is before Eve was created. God created Adam from the ground, and he places him in the Garden of Eden. And in Genesis 2.15, he tells Adam to work the garden and to keep the garden. That word keep is the same word shamar, to guard, to protect, to watch. Adam, in Genesis 2, was tasked with working and guarding the things of the garden from intruders. And we see just the next page in the Bible later that he fails in spectacular fashion when the serpent slithers in and twists the word of God to tempt Eve to sin. But Adam's responsibility was to guard and to protect the creation that God has blessed him with. And same for us today, that that the person is tasked with guarding and protecting their way of life, their holiness from intruders with the word of God that God has blessed us with. That is the way in which we are to guard and protect. Now the practice of guarding our way, of, of, of guarding our holiness according to the word of God, I believe is one of the most important disciplines that you can practice in your life. And students going to college, I know some of you are going to college at the end of this week, maybe it's the next week, this, is, this life lesson will, 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 will give you blessing upon blessing if you heed its wisdom. And for everybody else here, the same is true. <laughs> now, it's important guarding our way, guarding our holiness for, holiness for a few reasons. And the first reason is that good intentions are not sufficient for a holy life. Having good intentions to be holy is not enough to actually live a pure and holy life. Now imagine with me that you are in the emergency room. You have an illness that requires medicine to cure you. Now imagine that that, that the doctor on staff is there and, and, and he's ready, he's excited to take care of you. He has the best intentions to nurse you back to health. But imagine that this doctor gives you the wrong medicine than the one that actually will heal you. At that point in time, his intentions to heal you don't matter. Because of his ignorance, you receive something that actually wouldn't heal you. It's stunting you, maybe even hurting you than what you need. 
And there's a lot of Christians today who have great intentions of living holy lives. Great intentions of wanting to honor God, though they search for things that won't actually cure their disease. Won't actually get them to that place of holiness. They may reach for books or curriculums or self-help resources or experiences without looking to the word of God for direction. And just as good intentions with ignorance can kill a patient, good intentions with ignorance can lead someone astray without them even knowing it. The reality is, is knowing God's plan for holiness begins and ends in God's word. Knowing the plan of what God desires of us begins and ends in scripture. It doesn't start anywhere else. Now, books and curriculums and experiences are great supplements to what we're learning from God's word, but, but, but they fall incredibly short into actually leading us into guarding our way of life. Guard your life not with good intentions, but with scripture. The second reason why guarding your way according to scripture is so important is because guarding your way is a two-way discipline. Just like, Just Christians, like Christians can have good, good intentions, intentions and yet be ignorant, ignorant we can, we read, can the read the Bible, Bible and glean knowledge and yet be and yet ignorant of how the Bible, Bible is actually changing, changing us. us. This is so, so important, important for us today. today. Because, because we, live we live in an information, information age. age. We can get the most information in the shortest amount of time just by a Google search, more so than in any point in history. We can listen to books while we're driving. We can binge listen to podcasts, and we can watch lectures or TED Talks on demand. And we can do Bible studies at any time, virtual, in person, on our own, or with a group of people, and yet we can still miss an incredibly important truth from God's word. Psalm 119, verse 105, another popular verse says this. It says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I'm sure some of you probably are thinking about a jingle that you learned in VBS or a Sunday school with that verse. And while the Bible is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, it's also a piercing light into our hearts and our souls. Consider what the author of Hebrew writes about God's word in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13. He says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. That's an amazing and yet incredibly sobering message about the power of God's word. While God's word is a light to our path, where, 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 where it provides direction for us in big life decisions, in all of life, it is a light to our path. It is also something that pierces our soul. It is the strongest spiritual CT scan that reveals to us our real spiritual state when we read, the God, when we read God's word. When we look at the Ten Commandments that God gives us, I mean, the first one, we're already guilty. God says, you should have no other gods before me. Done. Already guilty. And you, and you read through all of them. God's word allows, allows us to see how utterly helpless we are without God. And yet, it also shows us how we are redeemed by grace for those who follow Jesus. Like the author of Hebrews says, God's word is living and active. It is so powerful. And yet the danger for us today in our information and our Bible study age is to study the Bible day in and day out and yet never allow the Bible to study us. It's as if we put on that, that, that lead vest when you take an x-ray to kind of like get all the information of the Bible and yet you don't want the Bible to pierce your heart and soul to expose the sin that's within. Here's the reality when it comes to God's word. To the degree that we allow God's word to penetrate and illuminate our lives is the amount of opportunity for spiritual growth and maturity we will experience. God already knows your heart. He doesn't need you to 
to, to tell him what's going on inside. He knows your heart. But if we, in effect, just plug our ears when we read the Bible and neglect to stop and really take in and ask the Holy Spirit, God, what do you want to speak to me about from your word? Not your neighbor, not your cousin, not your wife, not our nation, but me. God, what are you saying to me through your word? If we don't do that, we are robbing ourselves of the immense and gratifying spiritual growth that takes place when we are searched by God through his word. I think it's David who prays, Lord, you've searched me and know me. He talks about, see if there's any offensive way in me. That happens through prayer, that happens through community, but it happens through the word of God. We read God's word and ask the Holy Spirit to illuminate what it means for us. It's so incredibly powerful. And the third reason why guarding our way according to scripture is so important is because intruders to our holiness come from within and without. And, and, and this third reason kind of goes in tandem with the second one, but this one this is, one so, is important so important for us, for us as well, as well today. today. At, 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 my at my former church, former church one, of our, one of our elders was, 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 was a really, really wise, wise man. man. He, was, he, was, he, was he was kind of one, one of those guys, guys who wouldn't, wouldn't say much in a meeting, meeting and you'd, and say, you'd something. say something and your mind would just explode because of the wisdom he had. But, but one Sunday morning, I was talking to him about his daughter's wedding that took place. And he was telling me something that he told to his son-in-law on the weekend of them getting married. And I sat down with his son-in-law and he said these words that, that I still remember to this day. He said to his son-in-law, now as her husband, as my daughter's husband, it is your responsibility to protect my daughter from threats from without and threats from within. What he meant by that is that as the husband, it's your responsibility to protect my daughter from the external threats, from the physical threats, from the emotional threats, from extramarital affairs, things that we think about as external threats to a marriage. But then he added the extra layer of saying from threats from within. And he was talking about himself. He was talking about the extended family. He said, you know what? You are a family now. And sometimes family can be overwhelming. Sometimes I can be overbearing as the father-in-law. And so he said, it's your responsibility to protect from threats from without and from within. To be on alert from threats from even the people that are closest to you. It was really insightful what he said. And I think that that phrase works for Psalm 119 verse 9 as well. We know the common threats to our holiness through the external. We think about threats to our holiness, we think about things like money or sex or substances or violence and a host of other things. But it's more challenging for us to look inward at the threats that live within, a, within us. Because the reality is every one of us in this room are sinful. Since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden, humanity has been under a curse of sin, as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 3. And as Paul was writing in the book of Romans, he wrote to Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews felt like they were pretty good before God. They were God's chosen people. They were the ones who were obeying the law. The Gentiles, they were, uh, they were non-Jews. And so they, they kind of needed some help with God. They were kind of the dirty, non-Jewish people. And yet we read Paul write, writes this in Romans 3. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. We've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As, as is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. What Paul is saying here, kind of a summary of Romans chapter 3, is that no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been attending church, no matter how religious you are, no matter how many things you've done for God, if you have a heartbeat and you aren't Jesus Christ, you are sinful and destined for eternal death. It's kind of the summary of the beginning of Romans chapter 3. And while it's true that there are external threats to our holiness, 
Most of the threats actually become realized through our sinful desires going unchecked in our hearts and minds. We know that for a fact. We know that that the external threats are those temptations around us. Temptations for more money, for more sex, for more drugs, for gossip, for, for whatever it may be. And yet it's, the, it's what's happening inside of us that wants us to do more of that. Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 7. I do the things I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I want to do. It's this, it's this cycle in human nature that there's things outside of us that, that our sinful flesh wants to do. And it starts from within. And we can't be ignorant of this reality. And we must allow God's word to get into our hearts and to allow the Holy Spirit to do the sanctifying work that only he can do. And when this happens, we can see the threats inside of us and we can ask the Lord in his grace and mercy for help. And when we do fall, we can go to Christ and say, thank you, Jesus, that you have died for my sin and there's forgiveness through your blood. And yet God's given us his word to guard our ways according to his word. One of Satan's great ways to attack Christians is to lull us into a kind of spiritual stupor or apathy toward what is happening within our hearts. The reality is it's, it's really easy for us to look at the things outside of us, things happening in the culture, in the world, and yet not focus on the real threat that's infiltrating our holiness from within. Robert de Rochefoucauld was one of the most interesting men during World War II. He was a Frenchman, and he grew up actually meeting Adolf Hitler, but eventually turned on the Nazi forces. And, and, and Rochefoucauld actually escaped Nazi death sentences two times by escaping their prison sentence, or, or their prisons, And he once joined the British group called, get this, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. That was the thing. To carry out a plan of sabotage against the Nazi regime. And at this point, the the Allies had successfully stormed the beaches of Normandy. And at this point, the Nazi forces were desperately trying to regain ground. And at that time, about 400 miles south of Normandy, Rochefoucauld parachuted into Bordeaux to meet three undercover British spies who were working at a munitions plant in St. Medard. These four men, Rochefoucauld and these three men who had been there for a while, they began to make maps of the munitions plant. And they got a disguise for Rochefoucauld as a plant worker. And the disguise was actually so bad that all of them were nervous that he wouldn't even make it inside the plant. Leaving all of them fearful of being caught. Rochefoucauld was an expert in plastic explosives. And they actually hid the explosives in a freshly baked round French loaf of bread. Because that's what people took for lunch those days. And the morning of, his, uh, of their plan, Rochefoucauld began shuffling toward the gate of this munitions plant with all the other people fearful that he wouldn't be let in, that he'd be captured and that he'd be sent to the death camps for a third time for execution. But as we read in, in the story of his life, he talks about when he gets to the gate, shows the fake ID, the Nazi guard looks at him and either was sleepy or disinterested and didn't give much attention to the fake ID and allowed him through. And after a few well-placed explosives at the most vital places, Rochefoucauld escaped the munitions plant, completely crippling the whole plant. Now the irony of this true story, of course, is the fact that that, that a major munitions plant didn't take seriously any potential threats from within, and their lax attentiveness resulted in ammunition crippling their ammunition plant from within. And yet I wonder how many of us are paying lax attention to the threats to our souls and holiness from within our hearts. Have we become numb to the sin that's within us? Are we winking at injustices that we normally 
used to hate. The reality is this. If we aren't intentionally studying and meditating on God's word, then we are choosing to fight a battle without any weaponry. If we aren't allowing God's word to search us and scan our hearts, then we are choosing to turn a blind eye to potential threats that may jeopardize our holiness. In his book, The Screwtape Letters, I'm not sure if many, if, if how many of you have read it, it's, it, it's a book by C.S. Lewis, and it's a satire that he dedicated to his friend, his best friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, the, the author of Lord of the Rings trilogy. And in The Screwtape Letters, it's a satire about a senior demon called Screwtape. And he's writing to his nephew, who's a junior demon, called Wormwood. And Wormwood has a patient, which is a human, and this patient has recently become a Christian. And the whole book is, 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 is essentially their strategy to try to, 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 to distract this human f- from being effective for the enemy, which in this book is Jesus, because it's demons writing. So it's kind of backwards how you're thinking about it. The enemy is Jesus because it's two demons writing to each other in this satirical fashion. And one of the letters about keeping the Christian fooled about his spiritual state, Screwtape writes this to his demon nephew. He says, My dear Wormwood, obviously you're making excellent progress. My only fear is lest in attempting to hurry the patient, you awaken him to a sense of his real position. For you and I, who see that the position as it really is, must never forget how totally different it ought to appear to him. We know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy, meaning Jesus. But he must be made to imagine that all his choices which have affected this change, of course, are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. For this reason, I am almost glad to hear that he is still a churchgoer and a communicant. I know there are dangers in this, but anything is better than that he should realize the break it has made from the first months of his Christian life. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, fully recognized sin, but only with his vague, though uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing well lately. You'll say that these are very small sins, and doubtless, like all young tempters, you are anxious to to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy, meaning Jesus. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Though satirical, there is a great and sobering truth to the schemes of our enemy. Because we have an enemy who would rather have us do all the Christian things, do all the church stuff, the Bible studies, all the Jesus things, and yet miss Jesus. To do all the Bible studies and yet not allow Scripture to search our hearts and to know us, in a sense, to become Pharisees. We must allow Scripture to penetrate our hearts and minds. The next question that comes with this is how do we do this? If God's Word is this guiding light to help us to be holy, to guard our ways according to Scripture, how do we do that? What are some practical ways for us to do that? There's two things that are two common themes in Psalm 119. And the first way to do this is to understand that God 
helps us to understand his word. And the practical piece to that is to ask God to help you understand his word. If you, if you flip a page or two in Psalm 119, the, the psalmist writes a section of the psalm that overflows with this idea. Look at verses 33 through 40. This is what the psalmist says. He says, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give, my, give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts in your righteousness Give me life. The position that the psalmist portrays here is so essential for us to effectively guard our way and to live the most flourishing Christian life. If you look at these phrases in verses 33 through 40, they are pleas here. They are prayers from the psalmist. And there's one in every verse. God, teach me. Give me understanding. Lead me in the path of your commandments. Incline my heart to your testimonies. Turn my eyes from worthless things. Confirm your promises to me. Turn away reproach. And God, give me life. It's a beautiful section of the psalmist. After talking about how, how beautiful the word of God is, how essential it is, how can a young man keep his way pure? By, by guarding it according to your word. And then just a little bit later, he says, God, teach me. I need to know these things. Because on our own, we can't get the full depths of God's word unless God gives us the understanding and the illumination of that. Each verse in this section is a prayer of dependence on God to act. There isn't an attitude of pride or self-reliance, but utter humility upon the Lord. And the question for us this morning is, is that your view when you read God's word? Is your prayer before you come to God's word, Lord, I, I need your help to read this. I need, I need understanding from you, divine insight to understand your word. And I think for us who have been Christians for a long period of time, this is a, this is a great temptation for us to be self-reliant. I know during my time in seminary, one of the greatest temptations for seminarians, you can ask any seminarian, they'll tell you, is to approach God's word with this idea of just being a book to study. Because day in and day out, you're, you're, you're studying the languages, you're studying systematic theology, you're studying church history, you're studying all these things about God's word, and yet the temptation is to not be formed by God's word. And I think for those of us who have done so many Bible studies, that can be the temptation for us as well. is our view of God's word saying, God, I, I can read it, but Lord, I need your help to understand it. Teach me, God. I'm listening. And you know, a huge way to help, under, to, to, to help um, in addition to primarily hearing from the Lord is reading and discussing and studying scripture in the context of community. It's so important. That's why being in person at church is so important because we can unpack God's word together. That's why community groups are so important because you can unpack God's word together because people have different experiences, different educational backgrounds. And they can look into this and say, yeah, yeah I see what you're saying for this. Have you considered this? An exciting opportunity coming up in October. I'm really excited about this. In October, we're going to do a, a, a series the whole month of October on neighboring. Because, because I, I, I think coming out of COVID, even, even though our fears out of COVID, I think neighboring is, is one of the best opportunities we have for evangelism. What does it mean to love our neighbor? And I'm excited about that month because we're going to take the month of October and we're going to open up community groups 
for people who are in the same geographical area. And I'm really excited about this because this is an opportunity to discuss the practical on the ground. How can we love our community together as followers of Jesus in light of what God's word says? How can we take the gospel as seen in God's word and how can we love through word and deed our community? This is going to be a great opportunity. And community groups are amazing ways for us to study God's word together and to allow our experiences and our relationships to help us grow deeper in God's word. So, so we're, you're going to hear more about this in, in the coming weeks, but, but it's going to be a, a great opportunity for us to love our neighbors, to love our city well with other people studying God's word. The other great way for us to guard our way according to God's word. And this is the third theme we see from Psalm 119. And that is to treasure and store God's word in your heart. And th this really is one of the most prominent themes in Psalm 119. is this idea of storing God's word in our heart and treasuring his word more than anything. We see Psalm 119 verse 11 saying, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verses 14 through 16 speak of the author's delight in God's word more than riches. Verses 15 and 16, he says that he will fix his eyes on God's way and not forget his word. Have you ever wondered how we remember things? Like, have you ever really thought about how we actually have memory and how we remember things? Well, thankfully for us, there, there's a bunch of smart people that have researched this and they tell us how that happens. But when we learn something, whether it's someone's name or whether it's advanced algebra, we form connections between neurons in the brain. And these synapses create new circuits between nerve cells essentially remapping the brain. And it's a beautiful thing. And I love it how, how science finally catches up to God's word. Like Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And science says, hey, you know what? We just found out. You can renew your mind by what you learn and what you focus on. Say, hey, welcome to the party. About 2,000 years ago, Paul talked about that. But I love it because the scientific community is saying, hey, we can remap our brains by what we choose to think about and what we choose to learn. Listen to this from the University of Chicago neuroscience professor, Dr. Bobby Casturi. He says this, he says, quote, a human brain probably contains 100 billion brain cells or neurons. These neurons are different from any other cell in our body as they make long connections. On average, each human neuron makes 10,000 connections. If you take 100 billion neurons and multiply by 10,000 connections, you arrive at a big number like a quadrillion. One way to think about it is that there are more connections happening inside our brains than the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, end quote. Our brains have unbelievable capacity to put things to memory. But the key to it is we have to be intentional. We have to be intentional. You only make connections in the brain when you repeat something to the point of making the pathway in the brain. And we talk about guarding our lives according to God's word. Our brains are incredible gifts from God, incredible tools given to us by God. And the challenge for us today, I'm just going to be very honest with you. The challenge for us today is do we want to put the Bible to memory? That's just what it comes down to. Do we want to put the Bible to memory? Many people say they aren't good at memorizing scripture. And, and, and I want to acknowledge that there are, you know, age or physical limitations. I want to acknowledge that. Because that is a real thing. And yet many people say they aren't good at memorizing scripture. But, but let me ask you a few questions. Who was the quarterback for the Vikings in 2009? What number did he wear? Anybody? Four. There's no doubt that a Vikings fan would know that. But that was 13 years ago. 13. Over a decade ago. 
Another question, do you have your credit card memorized? No judgment, no judgment, I'm just asking. What, what was your favorite song from high school? Can you sing it to me? Can you recite the Pledge of Allegiance to me? What's your favorite movie? And what's your favorite scene in that movie? Now I'm guessing that you could do almost, if not all of these things with near perfection. Singing the lyrics to your favorite pump-up song in high school sports or your favorite scene from a movie and, and, and playing it out and listing out the, 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 the lines in that movie or spouting out what players played for the 2009 Vikings team. And yet, if we can do that with little to no effort, then why don't we seek to put the eternal and perfect word of God to memory? If we truly believe, and this is to me too, if we truly believe that the gospel is the power of God, like, Rome, like, like Paul talks about in Romans 1.16, then why don't we put forth the same effort to memorize God's word as we do other things? I think we know, if we're here today, that we have a lot of stuff in our brains, in our memories, that's kind of useless, right? A lot of stuff. Facts, historical facts, whatever it may be. Not bad things, necessarily, but probably kind of useless. What if we took the supercomputers that God has put in our bodies to memorize God's word, not so we can spout it out at somebody, but so we can live lives that are pleasing to God. So we can have the tools we need when we are in this life. The ironic thing about our information and technology age is that our generations are more biblically illiterate than so many past generations. So what if the church took God's word that we say is perfect, without error, God-breathed, what if we took that and intentionally read it and studied it and put it to memory that we may share it with others, that we may share the good news of Jesus with those who haven't heard? Because I believe that our lives will look completely different, our churches will look completely different when we view God's word as that perfect word that we want to put to our memory and guard our lives with it. Let's pray.